Hello friends, you are welcome to today's video. My name is Benjamin. Today's video is on how to use Concord in English grammar as a key to answering WIAC English objective questions. If you are new to this channel, kindly subscribe to the channel by clicking on the subscribe button below. You will find a red button tagged subscribe. Click on it and that will be quite appreciated. Click on the bell icon as well, so that whenever a new video goes live on this channel, you will be informed instantly. On this channel, we teach various areas of proficiency in English. We help our viewers and subscribers to uh, acquire the linguistic tools that will enable them to communicate their ideas with clarity in everyday language use. And in addition to that, we help them to prepare for their English exams and teach them the, the techniques and tips that will enable them to score high in their English exams. Apart from English language use, we also share ideas, create videos on content creation because language is a powerful tool for creating content. So we create videos on content creation, digital marketing, and online business. On this channel, we share ideas with our friends on how they can create multiple streams of income by doing business online. So if you are interested in videos like this, you are in the right place. Having said this, let's dive into today's episode right away. First, a look at the brief agenda for the episodes. We have our agenda consisting of why, what, and how. Number one, why is Concord important in English grammar? Two, what is Concord in English grammar all about? Three, how to use the rules of Concord as keys to answering comprehension questions. We are going to look at this one by one. Now the term Concord refers to the agreement between the parts of a sentence in number person and gender in order to make the sentence grammatical. Now, when we uh, talk about number, we are talking about singular and plural. And one of the rules of Concord is that if the subject is singular, the verb should be singular. If the subject is plural, the verb should be plural. We shall look at the various rules and we also look at persons in terms of first person uh, pronoun, second person pronoun, third person pronoun, and the rules that apply to these various parts of the sentence, all right? Now, 
Now, why is Concord important in English grammar? Of course, uh, you know that this is uh, our point number two of the agenda. All right, so this is a typo here. It is two. Why is Concord important in English grammar? Now, to express a meaningful idea, the various parts of a sentence must agree together. And that is what Concord is all about. It's really important because each time a language user breaks a rule of Concord, the result is ungrammaticality. For example, if you say, Obi and Okeke is friends. I mean, you have just broken the rule of Concord because the subject is plural and the verb is, is singular. And that has broken the law or the rule of Concord. And you can see that the, the expression that I uttered is incorrect. To correct it, we must use the appropriate rule of Concord. And that means that when we say obi and okeke, the word follows must be a plural verb. Obi and okeke are friends. All right? So that's why uh, Concord is important in English grammar. Of course, uh, the other meaning of concord, which is uh, outside grammar, is also, uh, I can use it also as uh, something to uh, drive home the message here, because concord is all about harmony. But in grammar, we are talking about the harmony that exists or the agreement that exists between one part of the sentence and another. In the example I have given, we are looking at the subject and the verb, all right? So, and you also look into a family, for example, you know, there will be peace in the home if the members of the family are living in harmony. If they are in disagreement, then there is crisis. Now, this will help us to understand the importance of concord in English grammar. All right, so having said this, let's now uh, proceed to the next point. Now, of course, uh, as I already said, whenever there is a disagreement between the subject and the verb in a sentence, the result is ungrammaticality. The same thing happens whenever a disagreement occurs between other sentence elements. Now, when you look at this acronym, S-V-O-C-A, or SVOCA, if you like. Now, you can see that S stands for subject, V stands for verb, O stands for object, C stands for complement, A stands for adjunct. All right, these are the various elements of the sentence. Now, if you, if you look in the description section, you are going to find a video I have uploaded on, you know, the elements of the sentence. You know, you will find a detailed explanation on how these various elements of the sentence structure are arranged, you know, to achieve or to construct grammatical expressions in English. All right. Now let's uh, move ahead. Uh, of course, this um, is supposed to be our number three on the agenda. So 
I now change it to number three. Please take notes. This is a typo anyway. Now, what is Concord? That's the question here. What is Concord in English grammar all about? Well, in English grammar, Concord refers to agreement, the agreement that exists or should exist between parts of a sentence, such as the subject and the verb, a pronoun and its antecedent, and so on and so forth, all right? We are going to look at this, various rules that govern the, you know, how the various parts of the sentence should uh, relate, all right? Should be used together to achieve grammatical constructions. Now you need to understand that concord in English grammar is the harmony or agreement that must exist between grammatical elements within the sentence structure. Concord provides the rules that govern how words and phrases are arranged within a sentence in order to express a meaningful thought or idea. Now, perhaps we should look at the accurate definition of an English sentence. An English sentence can be defined as a group of words uh, that contains a subject and a finite verb and conveys complete meaning or expresses a complete thought, all right? That is a sentence. And for a sentence to be correct, that sentence must be in agreement with the rules of concord or should not violate the rules of concord, which means that the various elements or various parts of the sentence actually agree uh, with one another. All right, so having said this, uh, we now look at uh, the next item, which is how to use the rules of Concord as keys for answering legacies and structure questions. All right. And at this point, we are going to examine the rules of Concord and how they work. So let's begin right away. Now, the first rule uh, that we have to look at here is the rule that has to do with subject and verb, or what we can call subject and verb concord. And the rule states that a verb must agree with each subject in number and person. A singular subject takes a singular verb, while a plural subject must take a plural uh, verb. For example, the box is on the table. Now, when you look at this, the box is on the table. Now you can see here that the box, this is singular, all right? So this is the subject. The box is the subject, is, is the verb, well, on the table is the adjunct. So we can see that this sentence has the SVA structure and the rule of concourse states that the subject must agree with the verb in number. And so if the subject is singular as it is here, the verb must be singular. Now we will break the rule of concord if we change the verb to plural. For example, if we say the box are on the table, we have broken the rule of concord and the sentence of course becomes incorrect. Now, example I, I, the boxes are on the table. So here again, you see that the boxes, this, uh, is the subject, 
and are the verb. Now, let's use one here to denote singular. So it means that in sentence I, we have SI representing singular subject, and then we have VI representing singular verb. In sentence II, you will notice that this, the subject is plural. So we can use two to make it plural, S2. And also the verb is plural, so we make it V2. So this is the rule. S1 requires V1. S2 requires V2, where S1 stands for singular, uh, singular subject and v, uh, V1 stands for singular verb. S2, sing, uh, sing, uh, I mean plural subject and V2 plural verb. So I hope this is understood. Now the second rule of concord is called accompaniment concord, right? Something that accompanies another. And it states that a singular subject followed by such words as with, together with, as well as, or accompanied by, takes a singular verb. Now, let us give the example uh, so it, it shouldn't sound uh, complex, all right? Now, the example should simplify it. Now, let's look at example I, the principal as well as his staff is in the hall, all right? So here we have to, uh, the article is omitted here. So this definite article should be there, all right? The principal as well as his staff is in the hall. Now, Examiners love these types of questions. They ask, they set questions to test your knowledge of the rules of Concord. So here you discover that dash will always be here. All right, the principal as well as his staff dash in the hall. And if you don't understand the rule of Concord, then you will come with uh, the plural because you will be looking at the principal and also looking at his staff and you think it is a, it is, it is a, a plural subject, but it is not. No, because this is accompaniment concord. The real, uh, the real subject is the principal. And so we call this S1 because uh, the, his staff are not logically included in this in the subject you know the principal as well as or the principal with his staff or the principal together with his staff will always take a singular verb so the answer is is that's correct the principal as well as his staff is in the hall now let's look at this second one jane together with his sisters is here. Again, you, you can see because it, we, are, we are concerned with Jane, the other one that comes after together with, or after as well as, or after with, uh, is not included in the subject. So Jane is, if we remove this one, Jane is here. And then of course, you can see that this, accompaniment is separated with commas is just it has the same effect as you know putting that expression in a bracket and the the the, the semantics here has uh, ha, uh, i mean has to do with you know an afterthought if you like you know let me put it this way. We can reconstruct this sentence to give meaning to it. Jane is here. By the way, her sisters are with her or came with her, all right? So the first sentence, the principal is in the hall. By the way, 
his staff are there with him as well. So you see, the main thing being talked about is the singular subject. And then the other one is just added as an accompaniment. So that is the rule of Concord. Now, it will be different if we say the principal and his staff, that will make it plural. Of course, it will take a plural verb, but when you find an accompaniment, it takes a singular verb. So take note of that. Question number, I mean, uh, rule number three, compound subjects, that is two or more subjects joined by and take plural verbs. For example, the man and his wife have arrived. So you see that this is a compound subject, the man and his wife. It's just like the first example I gave, Obi and Okeke are friends, because that is a compound subject. It takes a plural verb. So here, this is S2, all right? And then have is V2. Plural subjects, plural verb, all right? Then sentence I, I, boys and girls were treated equally. Now boys and girls, plural subjects, were plural verb, all right? So the same rule applies. Now, once you understand the fundamental rule, this rule will, this first rule will continue to, you know, uh, uh, play out in different uh, other rules that we are going to. It's like that first rule for, forms the foundation and it sets the stage for other rules to uh, acquire meaning, all right, as we are going to see. Now, let's uh, go to the next rule, which is rule number four. When a compound subject, that is two or more subjects joined by and, refer to the same person or thing, the verb is singular. So again, you have to take note of this. We, it's, it's a compound subject, but both, uh, both words refer to the same person or the same thing. Now let's look at the example to simplify this. Example I, the president and commander in chief of the armed forces is already at the Eagle Square, all right? Now, who is the president? He is the commander in chief of the armed forces. Now, who is the commander in chief of the armed forces? The president. So, these two things refer to the same person, all right? You look at the construction. On the surface, it appears to be a compound subject, but logically, it is just a singular subject because both uh, attributes or both titles belong to the same person, all right? So it takes a singular verb. So the president and commander in chief of the armed forces. So this is a singular verb because, uh, I mean, a singular subject because it refers to the same person. And so is, it takes a singular verb. So you can always see that whenever we find a singular subject, then we know that what follows is a singular verb, all right? That's why I said that once you understand that first rule, you will use it as a criterion to figure out other rules and how they apply, all right? Now, sentence I, I, my redeemer and comforter is the Lord. Now you can see my redeemer is a, uh, is my comforter as well. So we are not referring to two different persons here. You know, the, the, my redeemer is also my comforter, uh, of course, and, and it's also the Lord. So you can see that this has to do with semantics. 
And you need to understand that grammaticality, uh, you know, goes hand in hand with semantics. Now, for a sentence to be adjudged uh, or to be considered to be truly grammatically correct, it has to be meaningful. And when we talk about semantics, we are talking about the scientific study of meaning. And so when we are talking about my redeemer and talking about my comforter, and we know that these two things refer to one person, then of course we know that we are not talking about two persons. Of course, one, uh, you know, it is just one person. If, if my redeemer were to be different and my comfort are different, then we will be talking about two persons. So that is the semantic aspect of the, of the rule of concord, which you need to understand. Now, rule number five, when two subjects, a compound subject refer to the same thing or is perceived as a single idea or unit, a singular verb is used. Now, this is similar. The other one applies to persons. This one applies to things. That's just the difference. Now, look at example I here. Rice and stew is my favorite dish. Now, you can see that rice and stew, you know, uh, do not refer to two separate meals, you know, the two put together, make one meal or one dish. So we are referring to one. And because it is one, then of course, uh, it has to take a singular verb. Uh, in addition to this, you will also understand that when we look at these two items, each of them is an uncountable noun. So, uh, even without uh, looking at it from the angle of referring to the same thing, we also understand that a countable noun must take a singular verb. So from that angle, it is also clear because rice cannot be counted and stew cannot be counted. And two of them put together, we still take uh, a singular verb, all right? so. The next thing, bread and butter is what Jane likes. Now, bread and butter put together will form a meal. And of course, it is singular. And you also understand that each of them, like rice and stew, is also uncountable. So you need to understand how the rule of concord applies in each case. Rule number six. When a compound subject is connected with correlatives, the singular verb is used. Now, a correlative, either, uh, you know, or, neither, nor, these are called correlatives. Now, let's look at the examples. Example I, either Hannah or Elizabeth cooks the family's supper. Now, you can see, now, either Anna or Elizabeth. So when you have two singular uh, subjects and then you have the correlative, then of course, a singular verb applies because here we are looking at Anna or Elizabeth, one of them. This verb applies to one of them not two of them because of either or. Now the same thing is applicable in sentence I, I, neither John nor Jack has arrived. This is a singular verb because this verb applies to either Jack or John, not to both of them. So once you examine this critically, you understand that the rule of concord always works semantically. It acquires 
uh, its function, it derives its function from the accurate meaning of the sentence, all right? So this is really very important. You need to understand first whether the, the subject is singular or plural, and you examine it critically in the light of the meaning, and then you will know whether it is singular or plural. Now, if the subject is singular, it has to take a singular verb. If it is plural, it will take a plural verb. Of course, always bear in mind that rule number one is the foundational rule, the fundamental rule. And I can say it is the foundation upon which all other uh, rules are, are built. And when you look at it from this angle, that will simplify the entire process, all right? Example number, uh, uh, I mean, III. Not only Mark, but also Matthew plays the piano, all right? Not only Mark, but also. So you can see that also is a correlative. And whenever correlatives are, are, are involved and you have two singular subjects joined by correlatives, then of course, you have to use the singular verb. Now, rule number seven, let's now proceed to rule number seven. When the nouns joined by correlatives differ in number, the verb agrees with the nearer noun. This is what we call the rule of proximity. Now, this is what we call the rule of proximity. Now, the, the particular subject or the noun that is closer to the verb, all right, affects the, the verb. So let's look at uh, the examples here. Example I, neither the principal nor the teachers have arrived. Now, we are using the plural verb here because uh, the, the noun that is nearer to the verb is plural, all right? Neither the principal nor the teachers have arrived because the, the word teachers is a plural noun and must take a plural verb. Now let's look at II, neither the players nor their coach is here. Now, the rule of proximity applies here because even though we have players here, the one that is nearer the verb is their coach, which is singular. So semantically, what we have here is S1, that is singular subject. And that's why we must have V1, which is singular verb. All right, so you can always see that that fundamental rule, rule number one, uh, is the ultimate, um, the ultimate determinant. You know, it defines or determines how we, you know, arrive at our ultimate answer here. Now, number eight: when a collective noun expresses a singular idea it takes a singular verb, but when it expresses a plural idea, it takes a plural verb. Now, this again requires, you know, examining the semantics of whatever expression we are looking at. Now, a collective noun is a noun that refers to a group of things, all right? And sometimes we, refer to that same group of thing as a singular unit or as one unit. And sometimes we may be referring to the, the various parts or members that make up the group. We may be referring to them in their individual capacities. And in that case, we are looking at the plurality of that collective now. So a collective now, has a singular aspect and it has a plural aspect. And you have to examine 
how it is used in a sentence to determine how the rule of concord should apply. Now let's look at I. The team has won all its matches this season. Now the team here uh, is deemed to be singular, a singular subject, S1, simply because it is, it is uh, pictured as acting as a unit, as a single unit, acting as a single unit. So we say has won its matches, won, all right? It's so singular. Now let's look at II. The team have started practicing for their next match. Now we are looking at the individual uh, players in the team, you know, acting as individuals. So looking at the team uh, from this angle, we are now looking at the team as a plural subject and no longer as a singular subject. In sentence I, we saw it as a singular subject because it is acting as a single unit. But here, the same team, you know, we are using the plural verb, the team have started practicing for their next match. Again, here we use, we have used the, the plural, uh, the plural of the, of the pronoun, all right, the third person plural pronoun. Here we used the third person singular pronoun, all right? So the, the reason is simply that we are looking at the team this time around uh, as acting in their individual capacities, not as a collective or single unit. Now let's look at rule number nine, a collective noun followed by of and a plural now must take a singular verb. Now let's look at this. Sometimes a lot of people get confused because there is a plural noun that is combined with uh, you know, a collective noun that is singular. Let's look at example I. A gang of robbers has been terrorizing the community lately. Again, you can see a gang of robbers has been because we are looking at the gang as a unit. A gang of robbers has been terrorizing the community lately. I, I, a team of Atlas has arrived from South Africa. Now, so that exactly is how the rule applies. Now let's go to rule number 10. And here you can see one, of plus a plural noun must take a singular verb. When you say one of, you know, this also sometimes uh, people uh, misconstrue some of these things. But when you examine the rules, then you will get uh, yourself, uh, you will get the record straight. And whenever you come in contact with something like this, you know how to apply the rules. Now, example I, one of the students was punished for lying to the class teacher. Now, you see here, one of, even though we have students, you know, the students are many, but, you know, semantically, we are referring to only one. It was not all the, subject, uh, all the students that were punished, it was one. So because it is one of, then it is singular subject, and what is going to apply will also be singular verb. Now take note of this, then sentence I, I, one of the new lecturers is a professor, one of. So whenever you have one of, because that is exactly the one you are referring to, you are not referring to all the new lecturers. You are referring to only one out of them. In the same thing applies to sentence I. You are not referring to all the students. You are referring to only one. And that is why 
the verb has to be a singular verb. Now, number 11. If the subject is a relative pronoun, the verb must agree with its antecedent. Now, the word antecedent refers to something that came before, all right? Something that came before uh, is known as the antecedent. And we are saying that if the subject is a relative pronoun, the verb must agree with its antecedent. Now, one of the examples, one of the relative pronouns is who, all right? We have who, we have that, we have which, all right? These are, you know, uh, these are all relative pronouns. So let's examine how the rule applies. Example I, it is Jack who has done this, all right? Not have. So you see, because Jack is singular, now the relative pronoun here is who. The antecedent of who is Jack, and Jack is singular, all right? So it is the antecedent that determines the verb, whether it is singular or plural. And because the antecedent of the relative pronoun is singular, the verb has to be singular. So that complies with the rule 11, which states that if the subject is a relative pronoun, the verb must agree with its antecedent. Now you can see the verb agrees with its antecedent. The antecedent is the noun that comes before the relative pronoun. Now let's look at example I, I. It is you who have a case to answer, not has. Now, because the antecedent of who is you, and so if we remove this, you know, if, if we, for instance, remove it is, and we remove who, then what do we have? We, we, in mathematics, you talk of elimination. Now, if we eliminate these other things, what do we have? You have a case to answer. If we eliminate these also, so you can as well use the elimination method if you get confused. When you eliminate this, what you have is Jack. You cannot say that Jack have, you must say that Jack has. Jack has done. You have a case to answer. So you can see that whichever way we look at it, the rule of concord is always correct. Then I, 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 Olu is one of those who take bribe. Now you can see this can be confusing because we earlier said that when you have one of, uh, or it's followed by a pronoun, then what follows is, um, what follows uh, is a, a singular verb. But here it is an exception. Olu is one of those because those is the antecedent of who, all right? Now, in this case, the, semantic, the semantics when examined critically is actually obvious. Now, those who take bribe, they are many, all right? And then Olu is one of those, you see. So here we are talking about, you know, those who, who take bribe, they are in plural, but Olu happens to be one of them. So in this case, because we have a relative pronoun and its antecedent, then the rule, this pronoun antecedent rule now takes, uh, uh, takes uh, a prominent position here. Now, number 12, more than one, when you find the expression more than one, it takes a singular verb, even though it appears to be plural in meaning. When you look at it, you know, it, it, it appears to be plural, but this is, of course, one of the arbitrary 
uh, uh, characteristics of English as a language, all right? More than one takes a singular verb. Let's look at the examples. More than one person has died in the clinic this week. Not, you know, uh, not, uh, not, not, uh, of course, we are talking of person, not children here, not persons, but person. More than one person has died in the clinic this week. All right. Then more than one robber was killed by the policeman during the shootout. Not more than one robbers because you cannot pluralize one. The same thing here, you cannot pluralize one in sentence one, in sentence I, neither can you in sentence I, I. So you look at it because you are talking of more than one, all right? So let's now go to uh, rule number 13. Now, and rule number 13 states that if the subject is an infinity, a gerund, a verbal noun, or a noun clause, the verb is singular. Now, you need to understand these grammatical terminologies. An infinitive is, um, you know, always uh, a, a verbal that begins with two, all right? And sometimes it could be the one that ends in ing. There are, you know, you have uh, to infinity, which of course qualifies as an infinitive phrase. Then you have the, 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 you know, the infinitive that ends with ing, of course, which of course also is a verbal. A verbal is a verb form that is used either as a noun or as an adjective, all right? So I have uploaded various videos on infinitives on, and also on participles. So look for such videos and you will have a detailed explanation of these verbals, verbal forms that are used uh, not as verbs, but either as a noun or as an adjective. All right, so let's look at the examples here. Example I to A is human. So the infinitive here is to A. To A is human, all right? This also is an example of nominalization. When you take a verb and you convert it to a noun, that is a grammatical uh, concept known as nominalization. You will also find videos uh, uploaded on my channel that gives a detailed discussion, a detailed explanation uh, on nominalization. All right, so then sentence I, I, singing gives me much pleasure. Singing is an infinity, all right? It's an infinity. All right, so then that he looted the treasury is an open secret. Yeah, of course, singing here, let me correct something. Singing here is used as a geron because you can see that, uh, I mean, singing actually is a participle. So the, the infinitive actually is, is uh, the first one, that is I, but when you find a verb ending in ing, it is a present participle. And when it is used in this way, when it is used as a noun, it is called a gerund. So when you say cooking is my hobby, singing gives me much pleasure. Of course, it is a gerund and it must take a singular verb. Now, I, 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 this is, a, this of course is um, a noun clause and it also takes 
it also takes a singular verb that he looted the treasury is an open secret. Now, the noun clause is that he looted the treasury. Now, rule number 14, Demo uh, demonstrative adjectives must agree in number with the nouns they qualify. Demonstrative adjectives are, you know, the derivative of demonstrative pronouns when they are used to, uh, to modify a noun, then they are demonstrative adjectives. Let's look at examples. Example I, this kind of person is not good for the post. Now, you can see this refers to person, this kind of person. So it's one person, this kind of person is not good for the post. And so because uh, we are talking of a singular person here, this demonstrative uh, adjective has to be singular because it refers to a singular uh, subject. Then you look at here, if we should be talking about kinds of persons and no longer kind of person, now, if, if we pluralize this, then we ha also have to pluralize the demonstrative adjective. For example, these kinds of persons, these kinds of persons. On the other hand, we have this kind of person. So that is the rule. Then I, I, those varieties of crops are likely to grow well there. Those varieties, because we are talking about varieties, you know, which are plural, varieties of crops, plural. And so the demonstrative adjective must also be plural. The plural of the, of, uh, the plural of that is those. The plural of this is these, all right? So take note of this. Again, if we singularize the noun, then we also have to singularize the demonstrative adjective that, that qualifies it or modifies it. For example, that variety of crop instead of those varieties of crops. Now, when you pay attention to the rules of Concord, what happens is that they help you to learn, you know, how to use meaningful and grammatically correct sentences. Rule number 15, mandative subjunctive Concord. Now, subjunctive Concord. Now, let's look at the rule that applies here. When prayer, suggestion, wish, demand, recommendation, or resolution is used in a sentence, the verb that follows must be plural, whether the subject is singular or plural. Now, you see, this is what is called the mandative subjunctive concord. And when we talk of subjunctive, we are talking about expressions such as prayer, suggestion, wish, demand, recommendation, or resolution. Let's take uh, specific examples. I, example, it has been suggested that she got back, sorry, let me take it again. It has been suggested that she go back to her husband's house, not goes back. Even though we know that in the, in the normal uh, rule of Concord, this she is singular and therefore the verb must be singular. But because of the, because of the, of the subjunctive, which has to do with suggested that, all right? Wished that, prayed that, all right? Recommended that, resolved that. You know, when you have things like this, of course, the verb must be plural 
whether the subject is singular or not. So that's what plays out here. It has been suggested that she go back to her husband's house. It would be wrong to say it has been suggested that she goes back. That would be incorrect. It has been suggested that she go back, all right? Then example II, the committee has recommended that the commissioner resign, not that the commissioner resigns, you know, because the, of the, subju the subjunctive that has already uh, been involved here. The committee has recommended that, you know, the commissioner resign, not that the commissioner resigns. I, 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 I pray that God give the family the fortitude to bear the loss, not gifts, because prayer is involved here. I pray that God give, not that God gives, all right? So this is when you have the mandative uh, sub subjunctive concords uh, in place. So let's now move to rule number 16. And this is where we have the principle of proximity, even though we saw aspect, an aspect of it in one of the rules. Now, when there is a list of nouns or pronouns at the level of the subject, it is the nearest noun or pronoun to the position of the verb that will determine the choice of the verb. We already saw it in one of the rules and in especially in one of the examples that we examine. Now, let's look at the specific examples here. Example I, if the team loses today's match, the players, the captain, uh, the goalkeeper, or the coach is to be blamed. Not even though we have a whole list of various subjects put together. The one that is nearest, uh, of course, to the verb is singular, which is coach. And that is why we have a singular verb here. Example, I, I, either Jude or his friends are responsible for the damage to the windscreen. Now, because his friends, uh, you know, are plural here, the verb that follows must be plural, all right? Now, rule number 17 has to do with parentheses. A parenthetical statement should not be considered in choosing the verb that will follow. That's a, an expression that you put in brackets or is, you know, is supposed to be in brackets. It's called a parenthetical statement. It, it, is, it stands separate from the other part of the sentence. So let's look at the examples here, all right? Now the parenthesis statement, parenthetical statement is an additional statement to what has already been said before. That's just the meaning. Let, let's, look at, let's look at example I, the coach, not his players is in the class. So here we are concerned with the coach this is simply an afterthought. It's a, an additional piece of information. So it doesn't determine the choice of the verb. I, I, the contractor, not many of his workers, is on the site. Now, because not many of his workers is just an additional a piece of information, but we are talking specifically about the contractor. In other words, we are saying that the contractor is not on the site. By the way, we are not talking about uh, many of his workers who also are not there, all right? So let's look at rule number 18, indefinite pronoun concord. We are now talking about indefinite pronoun, when you use an indefinite pronoun, an indefinite pronoun is a pronoun that doesn't refer to a particular person or thing. You know that a pronoun is 
a word used to replace a noun in a sentence. But here we have a type of pronoun that replaces uh, somebody we don't know and something we don't even know. So we can't really place our fingers on what this particular uh, pronoun is representing. And that's why we call this type of pronoun indefinite because it doesn't refer to a definite person or thing. So examples of indefinite pronouns are everybody, everything. Everybody doesn't refer to any particular person. Everything doesn't refer to anything in particular. Now, everyone, everywhere, no one, nothing, nobody, nowhere, something, someone, somebody, anyone, anything, anybody, each. Yeah, so you can see these are indefinite pronouns. And whenever we use an indefinite pronoun, we, it is followed with a singular verb. For example, in I, we have nobody knows tomorrow. All right? Not no. You cannot, if you say nobody knows tomorrow, that is ungrammatical. Because nobody is an indefinite noun, I mean, it's, a, it's an indefinite pronoun. The verb that follows is singular. So we treat indefinite pronouns as singular subjects. So this is S1. And of course, the verb has to be V1. Then example, like I, everybody in the family is safe, not as safe. If, if you say everyone are safe, that is incorrect. Everyone is safe, all right? Now, rule number 19, certain uncountable nouns that are collective in nature usually take a plural verb, all right? For example, we have such unique uh, uncountable nouns that are collective in nature. One of them is the police. You don't always use the police with a singular verb. So you say the police are expected to fight crime, not is. You can say a policeman is expected to fight crime, but certainly when you talk about the police as a collective noun, it must take a plural verb. Another example is aircraft. Aircraft provide an easier means of transportation, not provides. Even though aircraft is, you know, uh, looked at as uh, uncountable, yet it takes a plural verb. You can say that an airplane or an airbus makes traveling easier. So you can use an airplane with a singular verb. You can use an airbus with a singular verb. But when it comes to aircraft, you have to use that with a plural verb. Now, let's look at um, the other example, which, is, which refers to cattle. Cattle also is another noun that you know behaves in that way. Cattle are bought and sold in the cattle market. It will be incorrect to say cattle is bought. No, it takes a plural verb. Of course, you can say that the cow was bought in the cattle market. When you talk of cow, you can singularize or pluralize cow you can say one cow, two cows, or more cows. Now, rule number 20 refers to what we call pluralia tantums. Now, pluralia tantums are nouns that exist only in the plural. Examples are wages, headquarters, scissors, genes, funds, referring to money, annals, spirits, surroundings, guts, earnings, arms, well, that's weapons now, all species, the Middle Ages, entrails, bowers, quarters, 
headquarters, of course, we have seen it already. Bands means holidays, stars, swords, uh, wages, tanks, riches, rates, savings, remains, ashes, goods, that's referring to products, all right? Areas, outskirts, pains, particulars, fireworks, etc. All right? These are all uh, examples of pluralia tantums. On the other hand, there are some nouns that exist in plural forms but are used with singular verbs. Examples are school subjects like physics, economics, mathematics, etc. Diseases such as measles, uh, scabies, mumps, etc. Titles such as the brides, men of honor, heroes of our city, etc. News, series, means, etc. Now, you can see that when we look at physics as a subject, then it takes a singular verb, even though it ends in S, indicating that it is it, the form is plural, but the, the meaning is singular. So we can say that physics is David's favorite subject. You cannot say physics are, you have to say physics is. Now, measles. Measles usually affects people in their childhood, not affect. So measles, because it is the name of a disease, it takes a singular verb. The same thing with the word series, even though it appears like a plural noun, of course, uh, it takes a singular verb. So you say a series of terrorist attacks has left many dead. Now, a series of. All right. So these are, you know, specific examples of how uh, such types of nouns are used. Now, rule number 21 has to do with nominalization concord. I earlier mentioned to nominalization, uh, which has to do with when you turn a verb or an adjective into a noun, it, you are said to have nominalized the verb or nominalized the adjective. Look for a particular video that I have uploaded that gives a detailed explanation of how to nominalize uh, certain words in English. Now, let's look at this. When a collective name, excuse me, when a collective name denoting cat category is used, usually an adjective turned into a noun phrase to refer to a class of persons, the verb to be used must be plural. Now take note of this. For example, the wise, you cannot say the wise is, you must say the wise are, the weak are, the pure in heart, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, they. Now pluralizing that the poor the rich the rich also cry not the rich also cries so you can see that such expressions are always regarded as plural subjects the wealthy the successful the gifted the young in spirit the handicapped the helpless and so forth they all take you know uh, plural verbs let's look at two examples the rich have to help the poor, have, not has. I, I, the strong oppress the weak, not oppresses, because the strong is a, a, a plural subject. So when we talk of the rich, that is S2, plural subject. And so the verb has to be V2. Now, always take note of the fundamental rule, rule number one, that has laid the foundation for our, you know, clearer understanding of all the other rules of concord. Now, I, I, the strong oppress 
the weak, the strong here is S2, which is plural subjects, and then oppress is V2, which is plural verb. Now, rule number 22, plural number concord. We now look at plural number. Units or amounts usually take singular verbs, even if they appear to be, to be in plural forms. For example, 10 liters of fuel is not enough for the journey. Because of 10 liters, you might be tempted to think that the verb must be plural, but not when you are dealing with numbers. 10 liters of fuel is. $500 was not what I got. So you can see $500 appear to be plural, but it is followed with a singular verb. Now, rule number 23, every with, uh, I mean, plus plural noun conquered. So we, uh, these are also grammatical constructions. When you say every, then you follow it with a plural, uh, a plural noun. Then, of course, let's see the rule that applies. Now, when a, every, the word every, when every precedes a plural, the next verb is plural. But when it precedes a singular, the verb is singular. So you, you now see how it applies. Now let's look at um, example I. Every five referrals attracts a commission of $10, not attracts. Even though we have every here, we, but we are looking at the batch. You know, every five referrals attract a commission of $10. Then every referral, now every is followed by a singular noun. So it has to be followed by a singular verb, attracts. Here it is a plural verb, attract. I, I, I. Every man likes money. Now, because it's followed by a singular noun, then the singular verb applies. You will understand that everything boils down to rule number one, that when you have a plural subject, you must have a plural verb. And when you have a singular subject, you must have a singular verb. Of course, there are exceptions, but fundamenti uh, fundamentally, this is correct. Now let's look at rule number 24. And this concerns mathematical facts. Mathematical facts such as subtraction, multiplication, addition, division, and so forth can be used with either singular or plural verbs. For example, you can say two plus three equals five. You can also say two plus three equal five. So you can either use a singular verb or a plural verb. Whichever verb you use is correct. You can say two plus two equals four. You can also say two plus two equal four. I, I, seven multiplied by five is 35. You can also say seven multiplied by five are 35. So this is where you have uh, the use of either singular or plural verb as optional, all right? Then the last rule of concord we want to examine here has to do with all. We call it all concords. That is using the word all. When all means everything, a singular verb is used, but when all means all the people, a plural verb is used. So let's look at this. So again, you have an option, you, but here you have to look at the meaning critically, all right? Now, sentence I, all is well 
with my soul. Because here, all means everything. Everything is well. And you know, everything is an indefinite pronoun, which of course must take a singular verb. Then, example, I, I, all are ready in the pitch. All are already in the pitch. Here you are referring to all the persons, many persons, all the people are already in the pitch. So you can use a plural because semantically this is plural. So all can be singular or plural depending on the meaning conveyed. And the meaning conveyed determines the appropriate verb to be used. So we, we have, this is where we draw the curtain in today's video. We have been looking at, uh, you know, how we can use Concord in English grammar as a key to answering WIC English objective questions. Of course, we have looked at these rules and how they apply. And you can see all the examples that we examine are potential WIEC English exam questions. Of course, because these are the types of questions that examiners like to set. They want to test your knowledge of the rules of Concord. And if you look at all the examples specifically, the various rules we have discussed and the examples we have cited, if you examine them, if you study them, if you learn them, this will help you, you know, to answer questions easily and correctly when it comes to uh, uh, English objective questions. So if you have enjoyed today's video, like the video and share it with your friends and relations. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you have not done so hit the, uh, the subscribe button and also the notification bell so that whenever a new video is uploaded on the channel, you will be notified instantly. If you have any questions, any comments, or any uh, suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. There are a whole lot of other videos that you might like that might be useful to you in your quest to achieve proficiency in the use of English. So as you browse through the description section and the entire channel, uh, you will find a number of videos that will help you to uh, master English in its various aspects. Now, I want to say a big thank you to all of you for being part of today's episode. And to all of you out there who have given support to this channel, I say thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye-bye for now and remain blessed.